Quebec City uh, uh, earlier uh, yesterday, it was minus 40 degrees C. So it's it's like it's like paradise here. <laughs> um, I thought that I'd be uh, presenting some. Uh, ah, there, there it is. Before going as such, uh, I thought I'd be presenting some information about my institute. So I have a few slides. I just want to to tell you just that you know where. Quebec City is where uh, and uh, our institute. So this is the institute. I'm working at the Institute of Nutrition and Functional Food. Uh, it's a relatively new institute for us. It's about uh, 15 years old now. Uh, I will tell you about. I'm a plant physiologist by <coughs> training, but uh, over many years I've had to do a lot of phytochemistry. And when I was director of the Horticulture Research Center, I was asked to join this institute, which is the fusion of four research centers, milk, horticulture, reproduction, animal reproduction, and the last one is our nutrition and clinicians that were doing research on, on many different diseases. So they all got merged, not merged, fused into this, this institute and so I became, uh, I started to work on small fruits, berries mostly, and health. So I do a lot of phytochemistry and I do work with my colleagues in the med school in the food food technology, food, uh, yeah, food technology, food processing. So that's, that's my background. For the last, I would say, 10 years I've been very much involved in phytochemistry and doing work with my colleagues, clinicians, running clinical trials to demonstrate how these products are effective, effectively working in the human body. Um, so this is Laval University. It's by the St. Lawrence River. Uh, it's, uh, if you know Montreal Canadiens. Uh, I don't know that. Yet. No, well, <laughs> that's the only uh, professional team we have in the province. So uh, they're quite well known. It's about 250 um, 50 kilometers uh, east from uh, Montreal. So we're north of Boston, about five hours north from Boston. Boston got all the snow this year, okay? We didn't get it. Uh, so it's cold, but we don't have that much snow. 
So ENAF is the fusion, it's a network. So we are seven universities and research centers working uh, in this, this institute. Right now we have about <coughs> 80 researchers uh, from the different universities, about 75 research assistants, professionals, and about 300 graduate students at the master's and PhD level. Um, so we have quite an extensive uh, research budget, and we do a lot of collaboration. And one of the purposes of my trip here is to try to start some new collaboration with my colleague Dimu that I've known for many years, but we want to, to get really something going. So we're interested in these, at the entry point, marine products, plant, fruits and vegetables, in general, and meat and dairy. So all the, these foods have bioactive components, and we are trying to demonstrate how these bioactives have an impact on these diseases here. So uh, diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular diseases, brain health, cognition, prevention of mental decline, and gastrointestinal disorders, Crohn's disease, inflammatory <coughs> bowel disease. But these, this is becoming a hub for us to explain all the other diseases, and that's what I will be trying to explain you today. How, how important is the gut in explaining many diseases that we, we are uh, in, uh, encountering nowadays? So we are basically divided in three teams, our researchers, the first team is the identification of and characterization of biomolecules. So in this sense, very much uh, uh, an alter ego of my colleague, uh, Bimo Tatil. We have the same kind of lab, we do phytochemistry. But then we move the molecule that we find here to food processing to make sure that we can maintain the bioactivity of these molecules in the food that we are developing. And at the end, and this is the most important for us, is demonstrating in humans, animals and humans, how these <coughs> molecules are functioning and their activity, because we want to have some food claims. We want to be able to, to make publicity on the benefits of these biomolecules on health. So we need to, to carry clinical trials in order to do that, human clinical trials. So we do research from in at all stages of life, so elderly people, young people, and even embryos. We have a group that epigenetics. So how the mother's nutrition can impact the development of the baby, turning on some specific genes linked to obesity in particular. So this is an aspect that we are working quite a lot on. So I'll go really rapidly. We have uh, quite a a nice facility uh, for analysis, plant analysis. We are doing in vitro digestion. So uh, as you will see, uh, a large part of our research now is, is on the gut microbiota. So we are using this artificial system that is, has been developed in the Netherlands that is called the TIM. Uh, it's been developed by TNO. And this here is the first part of the system with the stomach and the, uh, the, the upper intestine with the ileum, jejunum, and all the different parts. And this here is a modulation of the colon. So uh, all these tubes here, this is the ascendant, transcendent, and descendant colon. And we are in, in injecting or inoculating specific microbiota, uh, feces, basically, in this. And then we can add in molecules and look at the digestion over this, this uh, simulator. Uh, so we 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 have a P2 system, where uh, a lab where we can do uh, some some food safety traceability work, and uh, a, a, a pilot lab to, to work on food processing. But mostly, we have this clinic where people are coming to get, to be fed. So we are developing a specific food, feeding them. We have a restaurant. It's like a little hotel. And we can really manage what they, and determine exactly what they eat. 
and then we are just following the, 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 the blood samples, urine sample. Nowadays, more and more fecal samples uh, when we are running an experiment. So we have uh, nurses that are, uh, you just see part of it. We have 12, 12 of these uh, uh, seats for uh, sample taking, but we also have a metabolic kitchen to feed these people, and making sure that they're really eating what we want to study. So as this is part of the institute. I'm going to skip this one. We do a lot of international co co collaboration. And again, I really wish it to, to be establishing a collaboration with Texas CNN. Uh, being French, and if you notice from my accent, I'm, I'm French speaking. Uh, we have a lot of collaboration with France. We, act, we created an institute called the Institute of Nutrition Aquitaine, Quebec. Then it's part of France, where Bordeaux is, where they have all the nice wines. So uh, I spent my sabbatical year last year there. It was fantastic. <laughs> well, this is enough for enough. I will move to. Uh, to my talk today just want to if you want to have more information about the uh, enough you can go directly to uh, www I see that and this is not our, our proper uh, web, web address. that's the one here so uh, if you want to take it you'll see all the professors all the facilities and all the research were, were conducted okay. well this is what I want to talk today so is how the food that we are eating is modulating the microbiota and has direct impact on many metabolic diseases. And in particular, one type of food that we have been considering for a long time for its benefits on health, that large class of molecule that we call uh, polyphenols, that we have, they are doing multiple, uh, they have multiple properties on health but we're not able to pinpoint exactly the mode of action of these molecules. And I'm, I want to give you some leads, some, some uh, I think, um, some uh, possibility to explain how these molecules are, are functioning. So I'm always forgetting to uh, that because that's the, uh, usually at the end of the, the, the talk. So it, what I'll be uh, presenting you today is the work of uh, uh, many people. In, th in four labs, so my lab doing the phytochemistry, uh, André Maret's lab uh, doing the, uh, the work on uh, diabetes and uh, physiology, <coughs> Denis Roy, who's uh, involved in microbiota <coughs> characterization and metagenome, and Henri, uh, Emil Lévy, who's a gastroenterologist with us. And this is not my lab. But this is Bonhomme Carnaval two weeks ago, and most of my students are there uh, enjoying our winter carnival. Because even though it's cold, we're having fun. <laughs> uh, okay, so we find a lot of the molecules, polyphenols, in fruits and vegetables. And we know that they're very good for, for your health, but we don't always understand why. Uh, this class of molecule, polyphenol, is very complex. There's probably about 100,000 different molecular species. They will come in different families, flavonoids and non-flavonoids, lignans. You find them in most <coughs> most fruits and vegetables. One of the best source is coffee with chlorogenic acid. You will find in chocolate a lot of catechins, but as well in tea. You will find resveratrol and cyanidine, anthocyanin, the color component in in uh, in most berries grapes wine procyanidine and that's the molecule that i i'm very much interested in because this is a molecule that is not very well absorbed by the, the human body when this here is a trimer of catechin and we know that these when we have more than three units of catechins the absorption is much lower. We we can absorb monomers and dimers, but bigger polymers than that, 
We don't. And these molecules can be humongous. You can have 30 units of these, of these uh, polymers. So they go directly when you eat them, they go to your gut. And then they can have an impact on your gut. Because the, 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 um, the, the, the feeling you have in your mouth of astringency when you drink wine, or you eat an almond, or you eat cranberries, is the protein precipitation, tyrosine linking of these molecules with your epithelium of your mouth. This is the sense of astringency. So they have this capacity of precipitating uh, molecules. But there's many other different compounds that I will not be talking about too long, very complex families. So when you look in the literature, and if there's not 10,000 papers on the effect of polyphenols and health, there's not one. It's, it's, we've, there's been a lot of reviews, and if you look, uh, you will find that berries in particular have impact on endogenous and antioxidant networks. They will induce phase one and phase two enzyme to decrease or detoxify some molecules, in particular in the case of cancer. Uh, they will decrease metabolic syndrome biomarkers. So if you eat a lot of berries, you can decrease diabetes. And we're going to be publishing in <coughs> diabetic research next in a month from now paper where we are showing that if you eat about 250 grams of strawberry every day for about two months, you're decreasing or increasing your insulin sensitivity in type 2 diabetes. So uh, these, these berries have, a, have an impact on the whole uh, metabolism, increasing uh, uh, insulin uh, effectiveness and decreasing glucose tolerance. They can decrease cognitive decline. They can induce apoptosis, so they're interested, they're interested in cancer. Reduce inflammation, and I will be coming back quite a lot on inflammatory reaction, because this is probably one of the mode of action of these molecules. So they will decrease cardiovascular disease, bad cholesterol, and improve endothelial function. Okay. So when you look at these, they're little wonders. You know, they, they are treating all kinds of illnesses. And when you go more specifically, if you look at the specific compounds in these classes, you will find that each and every of the compounds that these berries are uh, containing have all these capacities. So I will find you papers on resveratrol on all these properties, <coughs> health properties, if you look at anthocyanin, it's just the same. If you look at elagic acid that we find in strawberries or pomegranate or other compounds like this, again, same thing. If you look at pro those polymers that I was telling you about, again, same impact on illnesses. So how can so diverse molecules can have an impact on all these disease at once? And not being specific, how come we haven't found this one molecule that works in all cases? So it's probably that we've been missing part of the capacity or how these molecules are working in the body. And that's what I'm going to be hopefully trying to convince you from now on. All these molecules have very, very low um, bioavailability. And they have been considered as antioxidants. Most people are talk, calling them antioxidants. And personally, this is a word that I've banned from my, my vocabulary. I'm not I'm talking about polyphenols. I'm talk, not talking about antioxidants. Uh, in the body, for a number of reasons, they are found in very, very low concentration. Much lower than vitamin C you have in your, or albumin, or all the natural uh, antioxidant uh, networks that, and molecules you have in your body. Some of them, like anthocyanin, circulating in your body, less than 10 nanomoles of, of these. And you are eating, if you eat fruits and vegetables, uh, about two grams per day of polyphenols. 
most of them anthocyanin. And yet, there are only a small portion of this is being circulating in the body. If you look, this is pelargonizin 3 glycoside. This gives the orange yellow color of strawberries. It's only in your body for a very short time, less than an hour. You are getting rid of it in, your, in the urine very rapidly. So the residence time is, is very short, as you can see here. And it, they are recognized as xenobiotics. Xenobiotic is basically poisons, and your body is trying to get rid of them really rapidly. So how does it do it? How, how does it uh, achieve this? Is by activating transporters uh, at the brush border, at the epidermis, epithelium of the intestine, and just moving those compounds out into the gut lumen, into the feces. And if you look at the literature, you will find that people are not considering these molecules anymore as having antioxidant capacity in your body because there's no clinical relevance of this. We cannot show that it is the antioxidant activity of these molecules in the body that is explaining all the disease I showed you. So if it's not if it's not antioxidant and we've most of the thousands of papers that I told you about dealing on antioxidants, uh, I mean on polyphenol, most of them are on antioxidant because it was the trend in the 80s, the 90s, early 2000s to to understand this antioxidant activity as the mode of action. But nowadays we are moving to another understanding because we have new tools, new analytical tools to understand a big part of how these molecules can impact your health. So we are dealing now on the modulation of the gut microbiota by these molecules and basically how they can in inhibit inflammatory reaction in the whole body. So, I'm certainly not, uh, this is not the first time you've seen those, those pictures. We are in very close symbiosis with bacteria. Um, our genome is partly human, but also partly bacterial. We call it a metagenome. And when you do metagenomic analysis of the microbiome of the bacteria you have in your colon, you will notice that there's about 10 times more bacterial cells than all the cells you have in your body. That's the first, first thing. You have, there's about 100 more genes, bacterial genes in your colon than all the genes that you're expressing in your whole body. And basically, we have about two kilograms of bacteria. This is why we call it the hidden organ, where we have about three, 100 trillion bacteria in, in our gut. So we are in symbiosis with them. They are providing messages to our body. And in turn, we are providing the environment, but also messages to select certain strains of bacteria that will affect our health. These bacterial uh, this, these bacteria we have in our gut are very active to degrade the polyphenols that we are eating fruits and vegetables and they will break them in smaller pieces that may have an impact on health. So we know that isoflavones that we find in soybean uh, are broken down to <coughs> equal and this equal molecule is the bioactive molecule in blood. So if you look at the native compound, it's not circulated. It's the, it is the uh, metabolite of this and the breakdown product that is constraining the activity. Same thing for catechin. It's catechuic acid, lipuric acid that might have the, the activity. There's lots of metabolism of these molecules. And when you start to measure the human body, these molecules, then you are, uh, you're finding a lot of different uh, cr crosses or uh, the, the same molecules coming from one polyphenol will be degraded in the same molecules, smaller pieces. So you, it can be ferulic acid, it can be vanillic acid, it can be caffeic acid. So they're broken down in smaller pieces. 
And these are the ones that might have an impact on health. So we should not forget this. Uh, so this gut microbiome is very important to determine metabolic activities. <coughs> uh, and it's at the origin of many diseases like diabetes. And we know that if we are eating prebiotic or probiotic yogurt containing bifido bacterium or lactobacilli, then you can alter the microbiome, and this might have an impact on reduction of weight gain, have an impact on improvement of insulin resistance, impact on glucose tolerance, and also reduce inflammatory bowel markers. That is very well known from the literature. When you eat yogurt, these are some of the, the uh, beneficial effects that you will find. But we're also finding nowadays that polyphenol from fruits and vegetables are modulating this gut microbiome and also have a beneficial health on all the same markers of metabolic diseases. Um, obesity, which when you, we talk about metabolic uh, diseases, is a disease that is affecting more and more people. And uh, so when you are overeating, you will be uh, accumulating a lot of fat in your, your cells, but you're also causing a major inflammatory response in your whole body, in the adipocyte, in the myocyte, but also at the level of your gut. At the, uh, and when you are eating pro or prebiotic, you are modifying this gut micro, microbiota, providing a metabolic dialogue between your body and the, and the microflora. And then you will have positive effect on all your organs. So when you modify the bacteria in your gut, and you will have positive impact on your liver, you have positive impact on the adipocyte, uh, reducing inflammation in particular, you will improve tight junction, and I will be coming back to this. Tight junctions in this layer of uh, epithelium you have in your intestine, the cells are attached to one another by proteins. And when you have inflammation, the proteins are not as strongly binding the cells together. So once in a while, you'll have a bacteria going through your, your uh, epidermis or intestine epidermis. These bacteria will be killed right away, but they will be releasing some inflammatory biomarkers in your in circulation in the plasma. This is a constant, constant inflammatory response that you are getting in your body. This is why we call it basal inflammation. And problems of diabetes, obesity, and even mental decline are coming from this constant inflammatory reaction you have due to the leakiness of your gut and uh, the loss of these tight junctions. So when you are eating probiotic, you are increasing the tight junction, and you are also controlling some of the satiety hormones you can control the appetite and reduce your urge to eat. So this is for what we find for uh, pro and prebiotics, but polyphenol we believe act in the same way. I'm going to skip this one. There's been a couple of papers lately uh, on the capacity that polyphenol have to modulate the uh, different strains of bacteria you have in your, your gut. This is a, a paper that was published uh, in France by a group of Joël Doré, a very extensive group that now are culturing about the, the or determining the composition of, the, of your gut microbiome, but they did that for 6,000 people. So they know the, the species, the strains of bacteria you have, the six, thousand people have in their gut. And what is this experiment? It's, it's looking at the impact of black tea, polyphenols, and red wine on the gut model microbiome. So they, this is in an artificial system. It's called a shine. It's exactly the same system I showed you before, that picture of the artificial gut. 
And what they did basically is they have three sections. So the ascending, transverse, and descending uh, colon. And each of these colors here is a diff different strain of bacteria. And what I want you to, to observe here is that if you are adding a single dose of tea or a continuous dose or in the washout period or in the control, you see large variation in the composition of these the strains of bacteria you have in, in the gut. Okay. And these polyphenols are causing a selection of the gut of the, the different microbiota in an artificial system. Um, I'm coming back to this picture because I want to show you some graphs. And this, is, this is just again to explain the etiology of obesity and a lot of metabolic diseases. So when you are obese, you have a change in your microbiota. If you are eating a lot of fat, a lot of starchy food, you will be selecting some bacteria that will degrade this type of food. And this, these bacteria, belongs mostly to this class of, of bacteria that we call firmicutes, that will degrade starch and, and partly fat, produce a lot of fatty acids that we're going to be absorbing and putting in our fat tissue. Okay. And you will be reducing the quantity of those bacterioidetes, this one strain of bacteria. But this one strain of this family of uh, bacteria are causing massive inflammatory reaction at the level of the gut epithelium. They will decrease or produce inflammation and they will decrease those tight binding proteins that we find in attaching the cells of your intestine, the enterocyte we call it. And these are zonulin, oclizin, they are the tight binding proteins. And when you have inflammation, mostly caused by these bacteria, you are decreasing the integrity of, of the gut lining. And once again, once you are decreasing the, the, the simen between the cells, you will increase gut permeability. So once in a while, one bacteria will go in. It will be killed right away <coughs> by macrophages, but it will release the cell wall. The cell wall are very are uh, lipopolysaccharides, LPS. So these, this is what you see here. Those little pieces of polysaccharides that are recognized by our inflammatory system right away, um, because it's a defense system that we are that we have against bacteria. So we have these inflammatory factors this, that are flowing in our plasma. In our blood and this process of obesity link gut leakiness is called metabolic endotoxemia and this is called causing more inflammation in the deposite in the liver in the, and, and in decreasing insulin sensitivity so it, it's at the origin of development of type 2 diabetes so I'm showing this again because I will be showing you some results of an experiment we carried with, with mice. A uh, very simple experiment that we are now doing with humans, where we have three treatments. So we're working on, I work quite a lot on cranberries nowadays. I look, I work with uh, prosanidine of cranberries. So we were gavaging uh, mice with chow, vegetarian diet, we were giving these same mice with a high fat, high sucrose diet. So this is the McDonald's diet, okay? Very obese mice we had after the running <coughs> period. And the, the last group is the McDonald's diet where we were adding the equivalent of about 300 milligram of cranberry in a human being. So this is not a high, very high quantity. It's a dietary amount of cranberry that you would you and me if you are drinking a cup good cup a day of cranberry juice you will be getting okay. so this is what we find we fed to the mice then we looked 
at after two months of this diet, what was the outcome? So we looked at weight gain, food intake, the modulation of, of the gut microbiota. That's what is really interesting. Inflammatory reacts, re reaction and bioavailability of these compounds. We published this paper five, about five months ago in the, uh, in the uh, journal Gut. Uh, and in the title, you will see that we are modulating one bacteria in particular that is called Achiamantia. So just remember this name, okay? Because it's an important bacteria. So basically we're showing, and I'm gonna show you how a polyphenol rich cranberry extract is protecting you from diet induced obesity, insulin resistance, and intestinal inflammation. So what are the results? So it's very easy, only three treatments we did over time. Over the 60 days of the experiment, this is the weight gain of our mice in the iPad diet. So our mice were gaining weight. They were getting obese. The next is the chow, the vegetarian diet, the round circle here, not gaining weight. But when we were adding the cranberry extract with the high fat diet, whoops, as, a, as a, uh, if it was magic, our mice didn't gain any weight. We noticed that about seven years ago, we did a human clinical trial with cranberry juice. And uh, the uh, primary outcome of this disease was to look at reduction of LDL cholesterol. And we showed that when you are drinking, when men are drinking, it was mostly men we had in, in the study, when we're drinking cranberry juice, um, we could re reduce bad cholesterol and increase HDL cholesterol quite effectively, almost as effectively as, as statins, the drug that is normally used for um, controlling uh, cholesterol, <coughs> but we also noticed, and seven years ago we didn't understand what was happening, but the men that were on our diet had lost almost a centimeter of their uh, dirt uh, waste size. Okay. So there's an impact of these molecules on obesity. So no weight gain. Energy intake was about the same, a little bit less here, but uh, I won't talk too much about this. If you look at distribution of fat in the different tissues of the mice, you will find that the cranberry and eye fat has less visceral adiposity, say a little less of this fat being stored in under the skin uh, of the mice also. So we looked at how this treatment is impacting on energy metabolism. And one of the ways to determine the sensitivity to glucose is to do what we call a neural glucose tolerance test. So we are drinking sugar, and we are looking at the rapidity with, at which we are getting rid of the sugar in the blood. <coughs> so you see here that with, this is the chow, so the, the blood is, is being uh, ex not excreted, it's being uh, exported to the different peripheral organs, so you have less in, in, your, in your blood. And this is the, the high fat and the, uh, the high fat diet and the cranberry diet. So not that much impact on glucose tolerance. But when we looked at the insulinemia, we are doing what we call a, a clamp so we are maintaining or adding a constant load of glucose in, in, in the blood. We're adding insulin just to maintain the glucose constant. This is a, a measure that is not so easy to do, but it's the best, it's golden standard to determine impact on, on uh, glucose metabolism. You find here that the chow is, the, the cells are, have a very high sen insulin sensitivity. This is the McDonald diet. The, so you need more insulin to get the same quantity of glucose being uh, moved into your peripheric, peripheric organ. And again, if you are adding the cranberry, you are improving insulin sensitivity. That's one of the 
basic take out take home message that when you are eating polyphenols from cranberry, you are improving insulin sensitivity. And one of these index marker of, of insulin sensitivity is the OMA index that is almost as similar as the, the, as the, uh, the chow diet, the vegetarian diet. So we looked at other parameters, liver weight, liver triglycerides, plasma triglycerides, uh, the uh, uh, malondialdehyde, which is uh, an indicator of uh, lipid oxidation. And again, when you are eating cranberry extract, it's always reducing, coming back to the level of, of, the, uh, of the, the, the control. And the picture is worth a thousand words. This is the liver of the, of the mice under the chow diet. This is the liver of the mice under the high fat, high sucrose diet. And if you, you look at the nice beige color, this is a nice fatty liver. In, in, in France and, and in Canada, I do love fatty liver. <laughs> Foie gras, it's not very good for your health. But when you are adding a high fat, high sucrose diet with cranberry, here's the color of the uh, back of the, uh, of, of the liver. So you are preventing a steatos, a hepatic steatosis with this treatment. So this is all good. We know that we are reducing some of the inflammatory re uh, uh, reaction at the level of the enterocyte. And this has impact on diabetes or the sugar metabolism of these mice. So what, it doesn't explain yet why we have reduction in inflammatory reaction. So what we did was to look at the feces of all these mice and we analyzed with pyrosequencing the whole metagenome. So all the different species of uh, bacterial DNA that was in the gut of these mice. And we were able also to quantify the number of bacteria affected by the, the polyphenol trees. So this is uh, in a nutshell, because if you want to go maybe deeper in the, in the different strains of bacteria we looked at, I refer you to the paper we published in gut. But here is the chow, here's the high fat diet. I told you that uh, there's a shift in the commensal bacteria, mostly permipetes and bacteriodipetes, the large, mostly the important strains of bacteria you have in your gut. Under the vegetarian diet, in green here is the permipetes, in blue is the bacteriodipetes, and all the other ones here are in very low quantity. When you are eating a high fat diet, you are creating what we call a dysbiosis. And this dysbiosis is really a shift in the composition of the bacteria. You are increasing formicates and decreasing dramatically the, uh, the bacterial data. So what's happening when you are adding cranberry extract to this? That's what we see here. We're not that much changing the patterns of these main commensal bacteria. Not that much. But we are increasing, and this is really spectacular, up to 30%, this one strain of bacteria that is in the class of the Virico microbiome. And there's only one species in our gut of this family of, of uh, bacteria. And this bacteria is called Achaemasia municipia. And Achaemasia, that loves mucus, municifila. So it loves mucus. So it lives in the mucus layer surrounding your enterocyte. And when you are lean, you have a big mucus layer. Your, your intestine is not inflammated. You have a big mucus layer. And you have a lot of this Achaemasia municifila. When you are obese and under uh, uh, inflammatory stress, your mucus layer is low, is, is uh, smaller, 
and you have less at your mask. So we have a colleague that uh, is called Patrice Cani in, uh, in Belgium, who published a pa paper in PNAS uh, two years ago, where he cultured Akiamasia municipia. He was able to isolate it. It's a strict anaero, anaero, so it's very difficult to culture in vitro, almost impossible. The idea at the time was if we were able to grow this bacteria, we might be able to have a real probiotic and reduce obesity in people if, you, if we can inoculate it. So there was a lot of paper in Nature and all showing that gut microbiome may fight against obesity and diabetes. So there's been a lot of these papers. If you go, want to go to the origin, is this paper in PNAS that was published in 2013, Acacia municipia. And Acacia lives in this mucus layer around the enterocyte here. Okay, so this is the plain ground of Acacia, and you and I'm, I'm on the chubby side here. If you are lean you have four to five percent of this bacteria in your gut. If you are obese, zero percent. The idea is that if you are adding a prebiotic, like inulin, you are improving the growth of this one bacteria. This is the work of Patrice Cani again in this paper of PNES. So he fed mice with inulin, okay, a fructans poly polysaccharide, this is three treatments, okay? Control, control with the prebiotic, high fat diet, okay? And high fat plus prebiotic inulin, okay? And the quantity of Achiamasia municipina in the intestine. And you see readily that if you only have a high fat diet, your obese mice, you are reducing the quantity of Achiamasia municipina. And the interesting thing, and again, this is why I wanted you to notice about the inflammatory reaction, is the more you have Akermansia municipida in the intestine, the lower is the LPS, lipopolysaccharide, circulating in the bloodstream. It means that the tight junctions are solid and that you have a very impermeable intestine. So in our experiment, we measured LPS in the bloodstream of these mice. And again, the chow, high fat diet, so they have a leaky gut. Some LPS are going through. And when you are adding cranberry, you are decreasing significantly this LPS circulating. So we are reducing inflammatory reaction. So we looked at a number of different uh, of different factors, and one of them is the production of mucus. Okay, this is uh, the uh, mRNA of the protein, the black hole protein that your your cells are producing, uh, the mucus, and the, the the gene is is producing this mRNA is called a, a mu2, and again you see that when you are eating a high fat diet, you have less mucus, less expression of this glycoprotein, and you have, if you are eating the cranberry uh, extract, you are increasing the mucus. So you can make the link between the high acamasia municipida that we notice, and the production of, of mucus. I'm gonna skip over this, because this is another piece of, of work that we did showing that the factor that is important to stimulate Akiamansia is the high polymers of prosanity. It's not all the polyphenols, it's this fraction of polymers of prosanity that is the most active, <coughs> the most active. So in a nutshell, what's, what might be happening here? Well, we know that prosanity that we find in cranberry, that we find in ap apples, that we find in many different uh, food food source, can directly alter the composi composition of the gut. We've measured that, and this this is the 
the slide I showed you that in an artificial gut system, it does change. Okay? But we also know that procyanidine have an impact on endotoxemia because it will have increased the tight junction and the impermeability of the gut line. And we, we've shown that procyanidine will increase the growth of acamasa. So what we don't know now is what is it's, yeah, the egg and the egg. We, we don't know what comes first. Is it the pack that stimulate the acamasia that are stimulating mucus production? Or do we, are the pack being sensed by dendritic cells that are poking and looking at the lumen of the intestine, saying, okay, we have, uh, we have these molecules, so we should maybe induce the production of mucus by the goblet cells here, and acamasia comes out, reducing inflammation. We don't know that. But what we know, one thing, is that a lot of this interaction is mediated by the in inflammatory immuno immunomodulation through lymphoid T cells, most probably. And if you're talking about lymphoid, lymphoid tissue, you're talking about systemic impact of these molecules in your gut through your whole body. That explains a little bit some of the response we see with cranberry juice preventing UTIs, uranium tract infection. One big problem we have, all the researchers working on really retract infection right now, we know that the procyanidine are, can prevent urinary retract infections, but, and we thought this is, was because of these molecule would go in the bladder and prevent the aggregation of the, the, the E. coli in the bladder, but what we find is these molecules are not reaching the bladder. So maybe, that through the gut, we are priming the innate uh, uh, immunomodulatory response, then preventing the, uh, the growth of these bacteria in the blood. So this is uh, the hypothesis that many people are working on right now. So this is my last slide. We have been promoting the consumption of polyphenols uh, in uh, for improving health we know that about only five percent of these molecules are probably are absorbed in the body only five percent <coughs> they're they are found in high nanomolar or low micromolar concentration are they acting as chemical cues for uh, determining the quality of the diet do they have an impact on health yes probably but we should be looking at the other 95% of these molecules that go directly to your body, that in your, in your uh, colon, in your intestine, where they can modulate the gut microbiota, either through direct antimicrobial system, either affecting quorum sensing, development of the bacteria in your gut, or inducing a modified ecology, producing antibiotic molecule defenses, increasing nutrient processing, increasing mucus production. And once you are increasing mucus production, you are increasing acamasia, municipia in your, in your gut, decreasing low-grade inflammation, and then improving your general health. So this is really a change in paradigm when you think about these molecules in this scheme versus their normal procedure, the more normal theory that we were thinking about antioxidants. So it's, I think it's a change in paradigm, and I think you will see over time a lot of work being done on the gut microbiota and how food is conditioning the gut microbiota, and in particular, polyphenol. I'm going to stop here and uh, open to questions. Okay. Very interesting presentation. I have a question. You mentioned at the beginning that historically, 
uh, many researchers, including myself, I would say, as well, when we started uh, this field, we were looking at antioxidants. Because when we made this correlation, uh, some feature studies showed us certain things, that's why it's happening. But you're right, it's a uh, correlation that's indeed causation effect. Yeah. I'm wondering, you know, research is a passion. Yeah. Sometimes certain topics appear in this field. Do you think there's a chance? that we're experiencing something similar to what happened before. Because, yes. let me put it this way, you presented what you presented, I, I agree many things, but it's not clear cut, you know, it's showing this is what's going on. And there's a lot of people putting emphasis on this, but I'm, I mean, I'm thinking that perhaps we're missing something here. Yes. We're, we're going to the second phase, where we're finding correlations, but it's not necessarily cost and effect. You, you presented the data of your experience yep. uh, with mice, mm -hmm. and you're putting emphasis on that microorganism, which is very yes, interesting. Yes, I'm, I'm going to read your paper because yes. it's very interesting. It's not the only one. It's not the only one, but I'll read more papers in this field. But there's, in your control, is the child diet. Yes, it does increase a little bit. It does it increase, increase a little bit. Yes. That's an excellent, that's an excellent, uh, uh, and, and we, we are in a position where we are uh, gavaging the mice. And we know that just the fact of gavaging the mice, we are probably causing some stress and some, some impact on the normal gut micro, micro, microbiota. This is why we want to do a clinical human trial with a much long, larger um, um, cohort. Yes. So this is giving us some clues that, yes, this one bacteria is important, but we have also some other bacteria that uh, are correlating very well with um, the response we see. And one of them is, is uh, Barnicella. Uh, it's, and this one bacteria is, is known to be uh, inflammatory, causing inflamatory reaction. And, uh, and it is reduced in presence of polyphenols. So it's not the only one, but this makes a nice story. <laughs> this makes a nice story for a reason. This is an important bacteria uh, that is very much linked in, in, in association with your enterocyte. It is living close by your, your cells. And it does modulate because when you are adding a chemasia, the mucus goes up. So there's a, there's a message that is being sent by the bacteria to your gut cells, telling it, produce more, give me a better environment, produce more uh, mucus. So this is why we're so interested in this one bacteria. But I agree with you. We just started with the tools we have to establish correlations and know what are the functions of the different, it's not only to look at the correlation, but then we have to establish functions of each family, each class of bacteria. And once we'll be able to know that one class of bacteria is breaking down sulfur, for instance, or breaking down this, this uh, starchy food and is improving uh, short-chain fatty acids, we'll have a picture of, we're, we're going to recompose the role of each of the bacteria in the gut. You know, it's interesting, it's just a couple of things that I see that are going to be a hurdle. Yes. Evolves. One of the things, that the there's like, like you mentioned, there's thousands of compounds in nature. Mm -hmm. So the question would be let me say that we are so specialized in our microorganisms that, you know, they are all also metabolizing those thousands of compounds. So that's right. one thing that we need to prove. Yeah. And then the other one is. Well, let me cut you off here because yes. a few other people have some okay. questions. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't have, I have two quick, two quick questions. Quick. There was so, one question. So first, first you have the hypothyroid or hypothyroid person in treatment. So you sorry. see two groups. You have yes. treatment without yes. treatment. You see the difference in gut absorption rate for fatty acids yes. or fat absorption. Yes. Yes. One question. Yes. The second question: Do you have a chance to measure intestinal hormones? Yes, the the and uh, the GLP-1 and all that. Yes, we did. And we are improving, increasing the, the, uh, the synthesis. And it's in the paper. Okay, okay you can have a look. So it's, yeah, that's for the question two. Number one, so the fatty acid absorption. Yeah. We did measure fatty acid. Okay, absorption. We did measure absorption. 
Okay, this is different. This, yeah, this is the next thing that we want to do right now in uh, in the human trial that we are running. Uh, we're not running it with uh, cranberry right now. We're running it with uh, apple pro okay. But we're doing that with humans right now, and we'll be measuring short chain fatty acids. If you get a guess at all. Couple questions. Did you have the opportunity to look at the baseline bacterial composition in any of your studies? Okay, yeah, I'm reporting because the way we did this, the, the experiment is we, we have the zero, the time zero. Then we started to feed the, uh, the mice. They, the, we, we were able to observe this dysbiosis, this change in the gut over a two week period. And we were able to get rid of the cage effect. Because if, if, you're, if you have uh, a mice in a litter, they will have, all have the same microbiome. So uh, we put them in identical cages. We waited two weeks so that the microbiome would adapt and started feeding them. And so we have this this data. I, I didn't show it here because I wanted to make a nice story. But again, once again, in the paper, you will find, be able to follow in the uh, supplementary data all the, all the uh, composition of You gave the mice not 300. Less than that. It's it's the equivalent for human for. Okay. So, so, so it was, okay. I mean, you I mean, understand. So we only gave uh, point, uh, 12 milligrams or 25 milligrams per uh, per mice per gallage per day. I thought you were nodding. 300 <laughs> milligrams is, is almost the weight of the. <laughs> One last question, anybody? Oh, please go ahead. I have a very simple question. Mm -hmm. That is like eating strawberries, like uh, berries of different kinds. Yes. So, do they help in uh, decreasing uh, weight, right? You said that. If you look at blueberries, cranberries, apple, prosanity, there is a lot of human clinical trials showing that you can lose weight if you are eating between 300 and up to one gram of polyphenol per day. There's, there's one paper that has been published in, uh, in a Journal of Nutrition by a group called Furia, De Furia et al. Uh, three years ago, they fed blueberries. They gave one gram of blueberry in a human clinical trial, and they found a, a, a reduction <coughs> in weight gain. In apple, the same. In strawberry, we're going to show it. It doesn't, strawberry that we fed, we're not changing weight gain. We're just increasing insulin system. But there's lots of literature on this. So it helps. It doesn't. Okay, very last question. Go ahead. Well, just going off that one, is that just a reduction in that inflammation then? Is that just the inflammation? That's our response? hypothesis. Okay. Yeah. It, it wouldn't necessarily be a decrease in fat. It's, it's, it's it's a cascade then. If you have inflammation, you are bringing in cytokine, reactive cytokines in your adipocytes, and you are changing the whole metabolism and then transforming some of these fatty or depositing those fatty acids in, in, in uh, adipocytes. So it's a it's a uh, it's a cascade. It's uh, that that you will, you will find. So yes, I think the origin is this inflammatory reaction. If you're eating badly for 30 years, then you have your whole body is inflamed, and then it takes a long time to reinstate a, a proper homeostasis of, of the uh, energy balance. Okay, well, let's give uh, Dr. Desjardins a Thank you. And I want to invite all the uh, students to uh, Peter Matil for a meet uh, lunch. So it's in Peter Matil today. We're shifting back. We have a beautiful venue for you and very healthy food. I'm not sure if.